Good morning. Good morning. You are juror 131, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, a couple things before I turn you over to the attorneys. First of all, I'm going to swear you in uh, because all your answers have to be under oath. So if you could raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that you will truthfully answer all questions about your qualifications to serve as a juror? Yes. All right. A uh, couple things as far as the layout here. We have plexiglass between us and plexiglass in front of us, plexiglass in front of the lawyer's lectern where they'll be asking you questions. Plus, they're a bit of a distance away. Um, given that whole setup, and I'll continue to wear a mask, uh, I want you to feel comfortable if you want to leave your mask on or to remove it uh, while you're being questioned. So if at any time you just want to take it off, feel free. Uh, if you take it off and want to put it back on, feel free. Uh, in either case. But whether you have a mask on or off, I would ask that you pull a little closer to the microphone so that we can hear you nice and loud. And I'm sure that'll be fine. So don't okay. worry. I'll, I'll adjust you if necessary. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, you filled out a questionnaire. Thank you for doing so. It gave us a lot of good information to start with. Um, is everything on that questionnaire uh, true that you recall? Yes. When the lawyers are asking you questions, they will focus you um, on specific questions. And they'll probably read the question and the answer, not to be confrontational, but just to remind you what your answer was. Sure. And I want you to feel comfortable giving a different answer, giving additional information, um, or even a different opinion, because opinions evolve. You know, since you filled out the questionnaire, you may have thought about other things that you should have put in. Don't worry about it being different from what's in the questionnaire. That's the bottom line, okay? okay. Now, uh, one of the things the questionnaire advised you is not to read any articles, pay it, and to uh, avoid the media about this case. Um, but we understand, again, it's been a few months since you filled out the questionnaire. Are there things, because the coverage is so extensive, uh, that you may have been exposed to? A headline, a news blurb, um, a friend talking about new developments, anything like that, whether this case or related cases, pretrial matters, anything. I came across the headline of the civil uh, settlement there with uh, the city and the Floyd family. Okay. And how do you think that would affect your decision in this case? I don't think it would affect it. I mean, they are separate matters entirely, so I, I don't think it would come up. All right. And, and it won't. I'll just tell you that. It's not a part of this case. It's different case, different legal issues, different parties. Uh, different decision-making process. Sure. Um, so you think you can put it aside? Yes. Um, question 10 in part one of the questionnaire asks if you could be fair and impartial. Uh, and you said yes. Does hearing about this settlement move the needle, so to speak? If you're right in the middle on impartial, does it move it one way or the other for you? No. All right. Any other information you may have been exposed to uh, since you filled out the questionnaire about this case. You got pretrial matters, parties, anything? No. All right. Uh, bottom line on that is you, you have to decide this case just on what you hear in the courtroom. Put aside everything you've heard, uh, and everybody's heard something about the case and have certain opinions based on what they've heard and seen sure. and generally. You put aside those opinions and what you may have heard outside the courtroom and decide this case just on the law, law that I give you applied to the evidence that you hear only in this courtroom. Yes. All right. Easier question. Did you recognize any of the witnesses on the list that we gave you? No. Okay. And we estimate this trial be a month long starting on, month, on Monday. Can you make that work personally and professionally? Yes, the only thing I would add is that I will be moving out of state at the end of May, so if that timeline changes to the right, it could be a little tricky. But at least for the next four weeks, like you said, it would be fine. I think the four-week estimate is pretty good. It may get longer. As you've seen, there can be delays. Yeah. Uh, but I'll tell you, you're going to have a really cranky judge if we're still in trial at the end of May. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's a safe bet that, that you should be able to do that without a problem. Okay. Um, even our giving some uh, leeway to both sides uh, presenting their cases, I, I think we'll be fine if it's the end of May. Okay. Other than that, anything uh, that you thought you should bring up before I turn you over to the lawyers? No, that was the only matter. 
Okay. Uh, then as to jury number 131, Mr. Nelson, you may inquire. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience this morning, and thank you for taking the time to fill out your questionnaire. I have a few questions uh, just kind of generally to get to know you a little better, and then I'm going to ask you some follow-up questions on your responses to the questionnaire. Okay. Um, so uh, let's start kind of uh, basic. You and I meet for the first time in some other circumstance, a party, a, a social event, whatever it may be, and we have our first conversation. What are a few things I'm going to learn about you during that conversation? You would learn um, I'm married. I have a young puppy at home, competitive person, so I, I follow uh, a lot of different sports, play sports myself. So this past weekend was obviously pretty exciting with the bracket. My teams didn't do well, but you know, it was exciting watching. So I think you would learn those things for sure. Okay. And I understand um, you're like an accountant by trade? Correct. Okay. Again, we're not trying to name where you work, but um, pretty busy time of year for you? Not really. Things have slowed down since the, all the filings from like 1231. Okay. Good. And I think there was an extension on taxes or for personal filing too? Outside my area of expertise. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, so you'd obviously heard about this case before you received your jury summons, right? Correct. And at, you, at some point, you learned that you were a potential juror in this particular case. What was your initial reaction to that? Uh, a bit of shock, I would say. Why, why shock? Just given the size of Hennepin County, I didn't really think that I would be selected. The probability was fairly low. Okay. Um, the numbers analysis, right? <laughs> yep. um, did you have concerns for your personal safety, your private, you know, family life, anything of that nature, COVID? No, no. Okay. Um, when you got to the government center this morning and saw kind of its current condition in terms of, you know, military and fencing and things of that nature, how did that make you feel? It's a bit intimidating, to be honest, but okay. it, was, it was fine. Everyone's been really friendly that I've come across. Okay. Why, why do you use the word intimidating? Well, you have multiple like barriers there. There were quite a few armed uh, officers and what appear to be National Guard there at the entrance. So it's quite a bit of show of force. Okay. Um, does that like Im have a, an impact on how you would view this case one way or another? No. Okay. Um, when you learned that we were trying to protect people's anonymity, uh, how did that make you feel? Good. Okay. At some point when the judge determines it's safe to do so, your name, if you were a juror on this case, would be released publicly. How do you feel about that? I understand it's part of the process. I don't like it as much, but I understand it's part of the process. Okay. Um, again, anything about that, uh, you know, dislike that would impact your ability to be fair and impartial in this case? No. All right. Um, can you think of a situation, whether it be in your personal or private life or public, or excuse me, your professional or private life, uh, where you have been called upon to resolve a conflict between two people or a dispute? Uh, yeah, I mean, a couple times probably at work. Okay. And when you are kind of called upon in that role to do that or to perform that role, what tools, what, what's your approach to that? Well, I'd say my approach would be to make sure I'm understanding what the conflict is, first and foremost. So asking any sort of probing or clarifying questions to make sure I, I understand kind of what the root is of the, of the conflict. And then make sure I hear kind of both sides and, you know, determine what are the facts from, from both sides. And then based on my, you know, experience and maybe whatever else I can, can research and opinions, I can, you know, help advise and uh, come to a resolution there or okay. compromise, whatever the case may be. Okay. Obviously, you understand that this involves, you know, kind of large-scale conflict between the state of Minnesota and Mr. Chauvin, but also within the jury room, there may be disputes that arise. Would you employ that same process in the jury room? Yes. Okay. 
do you think it changes the analysis if you are um, on one side of a dispute or not? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll rephrase it. How's that? Okay. Rather than being called upon to resolve the dispute, you're a, a party to the dispute. How do you, you're disagreeing with someone else. Yep. How do you try to resolve that? Well, I, th I would think I would try to approach it rationally and, and state the, the facts and, and try to stick to it there and, and then kind of see where that goes and leads to see what dialogue that brings up. Okay. And would you be willing to re-examine your own perspective? Yes. At the same time, if you felt it was such a critical issue, would you agree for the purposes of agreement or would you stand your ground? Stand my ground. How can you, how do you approach the analysis of determining whether someone is telling you the truth or not? Uh, I, I would say kind of you can read a little bit into the person as far as like body language is concerned and eye contact and whatnot, turn just like subtle clues. Um, and then I'd say just try to think through it rationally if, if they're telling the truth or not to try to determine credibility. Okay. Um, do you think that two people can observe a situation from literally standing right next to each other and they may perceive it differently? Yes. And how do you, what factors do you think would affect someone's perception of an event? I would say, I mean, it depends on variety of factors, but like the, what would you call it, like a traumatizing event or something like that. I, I mean, people always suppress certain things and even um, like as you're remembering certain situations, there could be like gaps and whatnot. Okay. Do you think that a person, say training or experience or education may impact how they perceive an event? Yes. Right. I and, mean, you know, in your uh, professional life, you may view a financial decision differently than someone else, right? Could be, yes. I would like to think that would be a little more objective there financially if you're sticking more to the numbers, but okay. you could, yes. Do you think that, um, again, ultimately, if you have two people seeing the same event and they have different life experiences or different training or, you know, different experiences with trauma, for example, that it doesn't necessarily mean that they're lying about an event? And, and if so, how do you determine which person's side to give more credence to? Yes, I, I would say that could happen. I wouldn't say that they would be lying, but maybe there's you know, missing pieces or things that they don't remember or, or didn't see, like you said. You know, uh, I mean, we're all human. We don't perceive and see the event all the same way. And so I would tend to try to determine kind of what's the truth is just think through it rationally and, and try to like piece it together myself to, to determine what really happened. Okay. Can you think of a situation in your life where you were 100% certain of something only later to learn you were wrong? More of like a um, less serious example, but I mean, last week playing playing tennis, you know, you think the score is one thing, and then you know your your partner or others on the court tell you it's something else, and so just talk through, you know, what were the the sequence of events beforehand to to lead you to the score line and come to the you know right answer there. Okay, I mean, so uh, when I know that that's a like I guess less significant kind of a example, but sure. I think it's a good example. Um, when something like that happens, I mean, do you readily admit that you're wrong or do you continue to fight your position? Just talk through it, I would say, and just try to determine, like in that example, you know, we, we just talk through it and talk through the sequence of events and then, you know, realize that I, you know, I was wrong in that case and, you know, changed my opinion and in this case moved over to the other side of the court. Okay. All right. Um, now, you know, your job as a juror is to listen to all of the evidence, um, to only the evidence that's presented in court, and at the end of the case, the judge will give you rules of law that would apply. Um, 
you may read those rules of law and you may think to yourself, this can't possibly be right, this can't possibly be the law, or I think we need to change this law. Can you apply the law as the judge gives it to you, even if you disagree with it or think it should be changed? Yes. No hesitation. I mean, I'm assuming, in, again, in your professional life, you're used to kind of in, uh, interpreting law. Correct. As it applies to financial transactions. Correct. All right. Let me just follow up with a few questions on your uh, questionnaire, sir. Again, thank you for taking um, the time uh, to fill this out. It, it's helpful. Um, before I get into it, I want to just make sure there's a video that's referenced, I think, in your answers as well as in some of the questions. And I want to make sure, because several videos have become public, there was a bystander video that, I, that went viral and became a news story. There were some body cameras, and there were some store surveillance cameras that have all entered kind of the public dialogue. Um, which of those videos have you seen? Just the bystander one. I think it's only one angle. Okay. Um, and I think you estimated that you just saw that one time. Mm-hmm. And Correct. by that, uh, did you go and watch the entire video or did one time or did you see just one news clip about it? I've never seen the whole video. It's only been maybe 30 seconds or so. Okay, so maybe scrolling through social media, through Facebook, and you see a few seconds of it, or seeing it in the TV news or something like that? Yep. Okay. Um, a couple of questions. The first question uh, asks you to kind of just, again, recite what you um, recall. You remembered uh, that um, a number of former officers held down George Floyd while, while Derek Chauvin in particular knelt on George Floyd's neck. Their restraint lasted for approximately five to ten minutes. Um, kind of a general recitation of what you remember, correct? Correct. And ultimately you also remembered that the initial autopsy said George Floyd did not die from suffocation, but a different op autopsy came to a different conclusion. Again, the question being is, you may or may not hear evidence about different medical opinions. Um, again, based on your role as a juror, can you set aside everything that you may have heard beforehand and focus exclusively on the evidence that, as it's presented in court? Yes. You were asked about your impression of uh, the defendant, Mr. Chauvin, and you indicated um, that you had a somewhat negative impression. You wrote, while I do not have all the facts of the case, it seems like it would not have taken four officers to respond to a call regarding a counterfeit bill, and that the restraint of George Floyd for five to 10 minutes may have been unnecessary. Um, so I guess the question is, is, have you formed an opinion about the use of force in this case? as to whether it was unreasonable, reasonable, based on what you've seen? Well, what I put in there was accurate. I mean, I think the duration was a bit, like I said, unnecessary, okay. or five to 10 minutes, whatever the exact number is. So that, that you for, it's another way of saying you formed an opinion that it was an unnecessary use of force. Right? For that duration of time. Okay. Uh, focusing specifically on the duration. Correct. All right. Now, if you were a juror in this case, you understand that police practices, police policies, that may be um, an issue in this case. Do you understand that? Yes. And you're not a police officer, right? No. Okay. Um, have you ever received any specific training? about how particularly the Minneapolis Police Department trains their police officers? No. Um, would you be able to set aside your opinion as to the duration of the, the restraint, listen to the uh, evidence as it's presented in court, and formulate a, a, a verdict based on the evidence? Yes. Um, you were asked about your opinion of Mr. Floyd and you wrote that you had a neutral impression, and you wrote, I do not know a lot about him apart from what was written on the previous page. 
that he was a middle-aged African-American with kids living in the Twin Cities. So you um, have no impression or have formed no opinion as to Mr. Floyd? Correct. Good. Um, you were asked about whether you've ever talked about Mr. Floyd's death with your family, friends, or coworkers, or discussed it online, for example, on social media, and you checked the box yes. So I'm going to parse this out a little bit. Have you ever shared or expressed an opinion online through social media? No. Um, but you wrote, at work, we discussed what we can do both personally and as an organization to help end racism, and I voiced a, a desire to educate myself on the subject, starting with reading a, a book. I have not expressed any opinions on George Floyd's death on social media. Sorry, I, I guess I missed that there the first time. Um, so obviously you recognize this started a, a dialogue amongst people, right? Yes. And again, your opinions, the opinions you may have formed or your, your organization's kind of you know, discussions, you have set all of that aside. Can you do that? Yes. Will you do that? Yes. All right. You were asked whether or not um, the community has been negatively or positively affected by any of the protests that have taken place in the Twin Cities since Mr. Floyd's death, and you wrote negatively affected. Can you explain why? Well, like we just talked about the the dialogue at the beginning to to start talking about you know racism and you know other topics, I think is great. And then when the dialogue started shifting towards you know kind of the the looting aspect of various targets and burning at the precincts and and whatnot, I think kind of the message gets lost. And and so I would say kind of shifted more towards negatively impacting the community and small business owners and whatnot. Um, on one of the pages, there were a variety of statements, kind of broad, generalized statements, and you were asked to um, rank your opinion, I guess, on some of those statements. Do you recall that exercise? Yes. And I know you may not remember every single thing that was asked or what, you're, what you circled, um, so I just want to talk about a couple of them with you. Um, the statement reads, blacks and other minorities do not receive equal treatment as whites in the criminal justice system, and you somewhat agreed with that. Um, what do you base your opinion on regarding the treatment of blacks and other minorities within the criminal justice system? Statistically speaking, what I've read is that uh, you know, minorities are incarcerated more frequently and for longer sentences for similar crimes as their white peers. So okay. I, I couldn't necessarily pinpoint why that would be, but it seems to point to that they're not quite treated equally. Okay. So you've, you've read some studies or articles focusing on the statistical, again, mathematical analysis. Correct. Okay. Um, you, the, the statement reads, police in my community make me feel safe, and you strongly agreed with that. Yes. Um, And you strongly disagreed with the notion of defending, defunding, excuse me, uh, the Minneapolis Police Department. Yes. Um, do you have personal experiences that shape why you think that police are there to keep you safe? Not necessarily personal experiences, but I believe that the police force is a necessary and integral part of our society. Okay. Um, with respect to one statement, you asked, um, or you were asked this, Minneapolis police officers are more likely to respond with force when confronting black suspects than with dealing with white suspects, and you somewhat agreed with that. Where did you, how did you base your, what did you base your opinion on there? Maybe not necessarily to, to Minneapolis. I, I haven't read as many cases, but I mean, you've kind of seen what happens in Atlanta and, and other places around the United States that seems to suggest that that would be the case. Okay. So it, your response would not just be limited to the Minneapolis Police Department? Sure. And I guess following up on that is, you, you know, you have a respect for law enforcement, and this case obviously involves the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, would you accept a police officer's testimony 
with greater credibility than a citizen's or bystander or an observer um, simply by virtue of the fact that they are police officers? I think it would depend on the topic. So if we talked about earlier like police training or something like that where there would be more of a subject matter expert in that case, I would put more credibility to them. But just because they wear a badge, not necessarily. All right. So if two, if a police officer and a citizen are observing the same event, right, um, taking it out of an area of expertise, would you automatically assign greater credibility to the police officer by virtue of the fact he's a police officer? No. Um, you were asked a series of questions about your opinion on Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. You had a somewhat favorable uh, impression of Black Lives Matter and a neutral opinion as to or impression as to Blue Lives Matter. Um, you wrote, I support the black community's fight against racism and inequality, but have not always agreed with the tactics employed by the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, is there something in specific, like do you assign Black Lives Matter responsibility for the protests or I should say the riots that occurred after Mr. Floyd's death? Maybe a, a certain degree. Uh, I know that the frustration, uh, you know, has spilled over into certain areas, so I can mean, understand kind of how it boiled to that point, but um, okay. yeah, to a certain extent. And wrote, uh, with respect to Blue Lives Matter, you wrote, I support our police departments who provide a valuable and dangerous services to our community. However, I think the Blue Lives Matter movement has not done enough to enhance the conversation on equality and other issues such as gun control. Right. So I think you're, I mean, again, you, you respect law enforcement, is that fair to say? Yes. But you would not, you don't assign them more believability or weight simply by virtue of the fact that they're police? Yes. You have a relative uh, through marriage um, who is a physician, right? Mm -hmm. okay. if, if you were to uh, be hearing medical opinions or medical evidence in this case, would you call that relative and ask for his or her opinion? No. Uh, lastly, you were asked, do you want to serve as a juror in this case? And you wrote, not sure. You wrote, I am willing to perform my civic duty as a juror in this case. If selected, I do not have a preference. So it's, right. can you, you'll, you, you strike me as a fairly analytical person. Would, is that the same analysis or that same analytical uh, kind of tendency that you would apply if you were a juror in this case? Yes. And again, focusing only on the evidence as it's presented in court. Yes. You can do that. Yes. And you would do that. Yes. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. So, what kind of puppy? He's a Bernice Mountain Dog, almost six months old now. Okay. Now, you've described yourself as being a, an analytical person. You're an accountant, correct? Yeah. Um, make rational decisions? Try to. Um, so, explain the rationale of getting a puppy. 
uh, my wife and I always wanted one, uh, so we don't have kids, but we wanted to have a dog first, and, and so it felt like the right time. You know, we we're working from home for the foreseeable future anyway, so could create a, some, you know, separation anxiety problems down the road, but felt like the right time to do it. As you know, you're going to have to you're going to have to feed it and take care of it, and it's going to do absolutely nothing for you, right? Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. You also uh, mentioned that you're into sports and you're currently watching uh, some basketball. Yes. Um, you also watch football. Yes. Um, you still watch football? Did you watch the Super Bowl last year? Yes. Um, Sometimes uh, during sporting events, certain players will make uh, political statements. For example, take a knee during the national anthem. Have you seen that? Yes. Describe how you feel about that when you see someone do that. I would prefer if someone would express their beliefs in a different manner, but I, I understand kind of what they're trying to do and, and raise the dialogue on certain issues. Mm -hmm. and, and how so? How would you prefer that they express their their opinion in a different manner not during the national anthem mm -hmm. uh, what is it about the playing of the national anthem that y you wish they would just kind of leave that alone what is it what is it about that I think it's more of a like respect for like those that have come before us and kind of the system that we have here in the United States and you know feel a great sense of pride in being, you know, a United States citizen. And so, you know, see people, like, not stand up and, you know, like, you know, remove their hats and, like, be courteous to it. I mm -hmm. would just prefer a different method for, for those to kind of get their message across. Uh, you indicated that you uh, read a book after a company dialogue, company-sponsored dialogue about um, racism. Is that right? What book was it that you read? I don't remember offhand, to be honest. Did, did, did you finish the book? Got most of the way through. <laughs> okay. Um, do you remember any general impressions or anything that you, that you got out of reading this book? It's been a while. Um, nothing's jumping out at me at the moment. Uh, you indicated that you believe that the, the protests kind of devolved into rioting and that had a negative impact on the community, is that right? Yes. And you somewhat ascribe the organization Black Lives Matter to the, the rioting and looting? You what was the believe question? That you believe that Black Lives Matter is responsible for the rioting and looting? I don't know if I would necessarily describe it as responsible. Okay. How would you describe it? Uh, like I said, kind of like the, the frustration kind of boiled over to do more of the writing. So um, I, I wouldn't say that the Black Lives Matter movement was responsible, but perhaps was a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. and, and just based on your own observations, would you be able to pick out any group more than any other group that could have been responsible for uh, rioting and looting that took place. Are you asking for the specific groups I think would be responsible? Yes, or if you think any other groups aside from Black Lives Matter could be responsible. Well, I would say no, maybe an unpopular opinion, but uh, you know, police force, I don't know if necessarily did also a great job at, at de-escalating some of the situations. And you use that term de-escalating, what, what do you mean by that? What do you think the police could have done better, I guess, in, the, in what followed um, you know, the, the, the initial protests and then when there was rioting and looting? Uh, not quite sure exactly what they could have done, but perhaps just something different would have been a, a more prudent approach. You strongly disagree with the uh, uh, concept of defunding the Minneapolis Police Department. Can you just share with me a little bit about uh, 
your opinions on that concept, what it means to you, and why you disagree with it. Yeah. Uh, well, like, like I said earlier, I think they, you know, provide a, a valuable um, service to our our society, and so I don't agree with you know defunding. I think you know if we want to have a dialogue about perhaps shifting some of the the different funds to different areas, I think that would be you know like a good conversation to have. But as far as like actually cutting funding for for certain programs within the police department, I don't agree with that. So would it be fair to say that you believe that um, where other programs maybe should receive additional funding, you would not support cutting funding from the police because you believe that they're essential? Yeah. And then on the um, the issue of your opinion of Blue Lives Matter, you said that you uh, think that Blue Lives Matter movement has not done enough to change the conversation on equality and other issues such as gun control. Can, can you explain what you would like to have seen uh, Blue Lives Matter do about conversations of equality or gun control? Well, I think you often see that there are like two different spectrums. You have like the Blue Lives Matter clashing against kind of the, the uh, Black Lives Matter. And so I think that, you know, both sides, instead of being more confrontational, I guess you could say, would have more like open dialogue about what they could really do to bridge some of the, the like frustration and things that are happening in our society. Take more of a practical approach as opposed to an advocacy approach, that be fair? Yep. And then in terms of your attitudes toward the criminal justice system, you indicated you believe there's room for improvement in particularly in uh, corrections and that there should be uh, more closely aligning punishment with the crime, better support for proper rehabilitation. Can you tell me a little bit about how you've come to those conclusions? Yeah, and this is more kind of what I've read from statistics is that, you know, once some folks are incarcerated. It's I don't remember the number, but it's higher than you know others that they will return to to prison. And so I think there's some sort of gap there in in the rehabilitation then to our society. And so I don't necessarily know what the right answer is to improve that, but that would be kind of an area where I think there could be improvement. Uh, one moment, Your Honor. We'll pass for cause, Your Honor. Right. Juror 131, you all will be on our jury. Uh, we'll have your report Monday at 9 a.m. You're also going to get probably a letter or other communications from the jury office on logistics and specifics regarding that. So um, the deputy will take uh, something from you, but otherwise keep that letter that got you in here today and bring it on Monday. All right, any questions? What time do you say? 9 a.m. Okay. So that's when we're going to start. So, but you'll get a letter with more logistics from the jury office, uh, okay. as far as where and how to report and that type of thing. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. You may go with the deputy.